Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, as Barbara said, we're very lucky to have Libby with us today. Um, and Libby works very closely with ALA and is also part of our Scottish Steering Committee, or ALA Scottish Steering Committee, sorry. So Libby is um, a retired policy advisor and prior to that, policy director of Edinburgh Animal Welfare Advocacy Charity, One Kind. Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, before that, she was a policy and parliamentary officer for the Scottish SPCA. She's a member of ALA Scottish Steering Committee, as I mentioned, and also a member of the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission. And in 2014, she was involved in founding the Wild Animal Welfare Committee, and she continues to act as a secretary for this committee. So I will hand over to Libby and she will share her screen and present her presentation to you all. And at the end, we'll have time for a Q&A as well. Thank you, Tiff. And um, thank you for joining us from the other side of the Atlantic. I don't know how much longer you can stay, but uh, very nice to see you again. Uh, so good evening, everybody. And I'm Libby, as uh, Tiff has explained. And, and also I'm now retired from one kind, although I did work there very happily for a number of years. Um, I'll probably be speaking for about 35 minutes. I think we were going to have an hour for the session. I'm sorry we started a bit late due to various technical issues, um, but that should still allow for 15, 20 minutes for questions afterwards and uh, I'll be delighted to hear your, your views or your questions. So um, I'm going to start by considering why we legislate to protect animals, all animals, and how this looks in practice, and then move on a little bit more to talk about protection of wild animals and uh, to tell the story of the hunting legislation across different administrations in the United Kingdom. And when I say hunting, I'm going to focus in on what people usually think of the traditional hunting, the mounted um, hunting of foxes using packs of hounds, although the legislation will cover other types of hunting as well. So that's where we're going to start from. And um, first of all, just to give a little background to the, the ethical background to the animal welfare legislation that we have. Um, modern animal welfare legislation is founded on our growing knowledge of animal sentience. Early legislation didn't use this term animal sentience. And in fact, the main domestic legislation we have still doesn't have the word on the face of it, but it is implied and it provides for the welfare of sentient animals. But in fact, even way back at the beginning of the 20th century, when we had the Protection of Animals Acts in, um, in Scotland and England, um, and I think that covered Northern Ireland as well. And that made it an offense to, uh, terrify or infuriate an animal. So there was already that element of understanding of the mental element of cruelty, although cruelty was the main focus of these laws. But nowadays we have the scientific knowledge of the sentience of many, many types of animals, certainly all vertebrates, and that imposes on us an ethical duty to provide for their welfare. So a couple of definitions to kick off with. What is animal sentience? And both of these are drawn from uh, a sort of consensus opinion, what the scientific literature produces and what various authorities say. I've drawn on the views of the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission because as Tiff said, I am a member of that commission which advises the Scottish government on animal welfare. So we describe animal sentience as the ability to have physical and emotional experiences which matter to the animal and can be positive and negative. So it's very important to remember that animals can feel joy, they can experience comfort as well as undergoing suffering. So that's sentience and animal welfare that we're therefore trying to provide for is the mental as well as the physical state of the individual. These are the, the main um, three elements, mental, physical, and it's an individual, it's not a population. Um, and therefore, to promote animal welfare, we want to increase the positive and reduce the negative. And that imposes both an ethical and a legal duty on us to provide for welfare. But how does this apply to wild animals? Well, just before I come to that, oh, now here we go. 
um, just before we come to that, um, talk about the domestic animal legislation that we have to protect animals from unnecessary suffering. So the first recent modern one was passed in Scotland in the spring of 2006. And then very shortly afterwards in England, there was another Animal Welfare Act and then the Welfare of Animals Act in Northern Ireland. And these acts are all very similar. They all cover domesticated and captive animals, animals that are under the control of humans. So some wild animals, for example, zoo animals, will come under that legislation, but free living wild animals will not. But they do recognize the sentience of the animal, they focus on the welfare of the individual, they place responsibility on anyone who's in charge of an animal, an owner, a keeper, not only to not be cruel to them, but also a positive duty to promote their welfare. And in order to make clear what that is, they all set out five welfare needs that such as meeting their behavioral needs, the appropriate diet, being housed with or apart from conspecifics, depending on what their, their natural environment would be. Um, but there's still a lot to focus on the prohibition of cruelty, which is unnecessary suffering. And that applies to us all, even if it's not our animal that we're talking about, it applies to every, every act that we commit towards an animal of domesticated type anyway. Um, but how does this compare with wildlife legislation, well, see, it's complicated, is <laughs> putting it mildly. And I don't want you to be frightened by this slide, but I put it up really to show what a lot of different elements are involved when we look at the legislation that protects wildlife. I won't go through it line by line, you'll be relieved to hear. But if you look in the top left-hand corner and the two titles in Black. These are international conventions, the Convention on the Conservation of Wildlife and Natural Habitats, or the Bern Convention, that um, dates from 1979. And it was the first international treaty to provide for the protection of species and habitats. And it includes a thousand wild animal species under its protection to a greater or lesser, lesser extent. Then shortly afterwards in the EU that was followed by the birds directive, as we generally call it. These obviously being international legislation had to be transposed. So at UK level, and that's purple on this slide, we had the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, but this was amended particularly after devolution in all the different administrations. So in Northern Ireland, you have the, the Wildlife Order, in England and Wales, Countryside and Wh Rights of Way Act. In Scotland, primary legislation has been brought forward three times to amend the Act. So I think you're beginning to get the idea and why Professor Colin Reid of Dundee University refers to it as a jumble of law. And then moving over to the right hand side, we have the Habitats Directive, which was a very important piece of legislation, again for species and habitats. It was transposed by different regulations, which cross over to some extent with the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which in turn was um, amended six times in Scotland. So I think you begin to get the picture. There's an awful lot going on about wildlife legislation, but it is not legislation to protect the welfare of the individual. It's conserving species and conservation means protection of populations rather than individuals. So when we're thinking of animal welfare, it's not necessarily adequate. So just to summarize a little bit about what I was saying there, the wildlife legislation sees animals in terms of population or species, not as sentient individuals. It not only regulates the exploitation of wild creatures, but it permits this exploitation, for example, through hunting, it permits the destruction of creatures that are viewed as pests, and it actually mandates the destruction of others. So we have a lot of legislation about invasive species, and it requires the destruction of these animals, albeit they're sentient individuals. Red deer culling is a big issue in Scotland. The badger cull in England and Wales, again, has been a very long running and controversial issue. 
Another thing about this legislation is that it is hedged about with value-laden language such as pest, vermin, management and control. And these are all terms that I think we would feel are rather outdated nowadays, but that uh, they, these do still persist in this legislation. And the end result is that some species are more valued than others. Um, a rare or threatened species will be more valued than a crow or a fox. And we, I think that our legislation reflects that. As I said, domestic animal legislation sees animals as sentient individuals, promotes positive welfare, and thus we have the contrast between what you're allowed to do a with a, to a fox, you can catch it in a snare, you can um, pursue it with a pack of hounds, but that would be illegal if you inflicted that sort of conduct on a domestic dog, and yet they're virtually the same. Um, very briefly, there are piecemeal exceptions to this kind of overarching population and conservation protection. So I, sh I shouldn't overstate that case perhaps. So we have protection for badgers as an individual species. We have protection for seals. We have, it is also if, uh, not only species, but also circumstances and activities. So there would be a lot of legislation now on the use of traps. We have humane trapping standards regulations which derive originally from the problem of leg hole traps being used on fur bearing animals. We have either new or pending legislation to ban the use of glue traps for rats and mice, which are very inhumane traps. And we have forthcoming legislation to ban the use of snares in Wales. We have a review ongoing in Scotland, which may or may not ban their use. We are waiting to find out. And in Northern Ireland, there is a snares order, which is similar to what we have currently in Scotland, which puts a lot of condition on the use of snares, but still allows their use. So that's a kind of general picture of, of what we have, but I'm, I'm going to um, really move on and look at the very specific issue of hunting and to consider how devolution has affected the different approaches towards the regulation or the prohibition of fox hunting. I don't think we need to stop and go into the welfare issues of hunting. I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the images that we've, we've seen and uh, the view that it's not humane to use a pack of hounds to kill a sentient wild mammal. So we had um, Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act in 2002, in England, we had the Hunting Act 2004. There has been a bill in Northern Ireland that you may well know about, and I will speak about that in a moment. And then Scotland had just had another go at it with legislation that's only just been passed because of difficulties with the 2002 Act. And I just thought I would mention the, the Republic of Ireland because by contrast, the Animal Health and Welfare Act which is similar to our Animal Welfare Act that I've just mentioned in a previous slide and uh, provides for the welfare of sentient individuals, but it specifically excludes hunting from its provisions. And that was by an amendment that was brought during the progress of that bill because the, um, the people were not prepared to, um, to abandon hunting at this stage. So a very controversial issue, but that's the broad picture of legislation so first of all, uh, I want to take you back to the heady days of 1999 when we had devolution in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, and we had our own parliament or, or assemblies and pressure groups, people who've been wanting to get things done locally were very, very keen to have their issues brought in front yeah. of this new legislative assembly and just see action on so many issues. One of these, of course, being hunting with dogs. And uh, a coalition was formed featuring IFAW, the League Against Cruel Sports and Advocates for Animals, a Scottish charity, which in due course became one kind, although I wasn't working at it in that time. They were very effective and they secured a member, Mike Watson, to lodge what was actually one of the first members bills in the Scottish Parliament. 
and Mike Watson launched it in March 2000. It didn't become law for another two years. Now that is twice as long as it normally takes for a bill to go through the Scottish Parliament and that is an indication of how difficult and controversial it was. Um, initially, it was drafted by an external draftsman, and it very simply took the approach of a blanket offence of hunting a wild man mammal with a dog, along with causing and permitting offences. And then it created exceptions to allow um, gamekeeping activities, various things associated with shooting. Most of these would have had to be under licence. So the concept of licensed hunting was floated, but it very quickly was dropped out of the bill. Now this bill had the most dreadful time. <laughs> there are three stages to legislation in the Scottish Parliament. We have the general principles, which starts with evidence in committee followed by a, a report and then a debate. Once the general principles are agreed, the bill has to go forward. The Rural Affairs Committee was not in favour of this bill, but in chamber, in the plenary, the general principles were passed. Then it goes back to stage two, which is further amendments in all of that in committee, and therefore the makeup of the committee is very influential on how the, the bill emerges. And I'll just read you a quote from what one of the SNP members said about the stage two process. He said, this bill has been a nightmare for our committee. A lot of our deliberations were trench warfare. We fought over every letter of every word of every sentence of every paragraph. We fought ourselves to a standstill on some issues. And I have to say, I was sitting in the gallery watching these fights going on and that, and that is really putting it mildly. Um, the end result that a lot of amendments were put in so that an inexperienced MSP would accept or not necessarily under the, understand the implications of what was being done. They were contradictory, they were overlapping, and they ended up with a, a bill that really turned out to be very difficult to enforce. Um, just to look quickly at the shape of the bill, it has an offence, the first basic offence is deliberately hunting a, a wild mammal with a dog. Now that is the first hurdle that we fall at because this word deliberately was one of the amendments that was put into the bill. Now, if you stop and think, what is hunting? Can you accidentally hunt a wild mammal with a dog? No, you can't. It's by definition, a deliberate act. In England, the Crown Prosecution has issued a, an opinion to state that. Various judges have said it is by its very nature a deliberate act. And yet this myth developed that an innocent dog walker whose Labrador ran off after a rabbit or a hare would be penalized and could end up in prison as a consequence of this legislation. This was nonsense, but unfortunately, du during the progress of the bill, this all went through and the bill was really damaged from the start. I won't go through all of the other details here, but I'll jump down to the last one. What the bill did was it did not limit the number of dogs that could be used for various accepted activities, such as flushing to guns, which would be a permitted activity. But you could still use any number of dogs. And um, the interpretation section helpfully explained that references to our dog are to be interpreted as two or more dogs. So it's a very, very confusing bill. But it was passed, it became law, and it was hailed as the first bill to, or act, to ban mounted hunting with hounds in the UK. Well, I've mentioned that the act placed no limit on the number of dogs that could be used for the accepted activities, things to protect crops and livestock, for example. So it relied on those per permitted purposes of protecting your resources and restricting the activity to only using dogs for flushing towards guns, and then the wild mammal would be humanely as possible shot. So, and one of the permitted purposes I should, should point out was pest control, not only protecting your livestock and your crops, but pest control. And 
thereafter, the mounted hunts, of which there's only 10 in Scotland, said, all right, this is not a sporting activity, it's pest control. We're providing a pest control service for our local farmers. We can continue to use full packs, relying on this exception, and off they went. And uh, the result was there were many, many breaches of what hunt monitors and observers thought the legislation was, but it became very difficult to get a prosecution. Um, partly difficulty of getting admissible evidence, partly this difficulty of proving that the act was deliberate. However, there was some success in hair coursing, so it wasn't all bad. Um, in terms of hair coursing, um, they are, have been the majority of prosecutions brought under this act. The cases are very few in number. So in the most recent year for which we have uh, figures, 2019 to 20, there are only 38 reports made under the 2000 and act, 2002 act, sorry, to Police Scotland. And of those 32 involved hair coursing, only two were fox hunting, three were deer, one was a badger. From the police, they then need to go into the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, that's our public prosecution. Only 13 of those went forward and not a single one proceeded to court in the most recent year for which we have figures. In fact, it took from 2002 when the bill was passed to 2015 for there to be a successful prosecution of a mounted hunt and there has not been another one since. The sheriffs in the court in the borders where most of the hunts are based were very critical of the act and um, published statements to, to say how contradictory it was. So it wasn't a big success, much as we were happy that the, the bill passed, but it was a point of principle, but really enforcement was very difficult. So after all this difficulty, the Scottish government decided to commission a judge-led inquiry and that kicked off in 2015. This was led by Lord Bonamy, a retired Court of Session and High Court judge in Scotland. And he reported in 2016, and he agreed that there were aspects of the legislation which were unduly complicated and that they were hindering investigation and prosecution. And he even agreed with what the monitors were saying that there was a basis to suspect that sometimes hunting taking place within one of these permitted exceptions was taking place illegally and that there was ground for those for that it was not legally conducted. He also said the language should be reviewed and he thought that this offence of deliberately hunting should be amended either to intentionally or recklessly or just simply using a dog to hunt. He suggested a few other things such as vicarious liability for landowners who are allowing the hunts to run over their land and quite controversially potentially reversing the burden of proof so that if you are the huntsman you would have to prove that your conduct came under one of the permitted exceptions otherwise as you as you all know the burden of proof is normally on the prosecution um, and he also suggested extending the time limit for prosecutions, but in fact that's happened separately under different legislation before the review. So we now have the new bill, the Hunting with Dogs Scotland bill, which passed on the 25th of January. It hasn't yet had royal assent and a lot of the regulations are still to be made. The Scottish Government accepted all of the Bonamy recommendations except for the vicarious liability and reversing the burden of proof. But following excellent lobbying from um, the animal welfare uh, sector, it, the government agreed they would add two more provisions. So in addition to the new offence of using a dog to hunt a wild mammal, nice and simple, they agreed that they would limit the number of dogs that might be used for searching or stalking or flushing a wild mammal and that these would be confined to the specified purposes, such as, again, damage to livestock, timber or crops, um, threat to human health, preventing the spread of disease. 
They also allow certain environmental purposes, so you can use two dogs, for example, to control invasive species. But this has to be under a formal scheme. You, you, you can't just say, well, I've got a scheme to control, um, uh, let me see, to, to, control, <laughs> to control squirrels on my land. It has to be part of a formal scheme. For example, there is a formal stoat control scheme in Orkney under our national nature agency, Nature Scott. So that's what is meant there. Uh, somewhat against our wishes in the animal welfare sector, they included provision for the licensed use of more than two dogs. So there is still potential use of packs of dogs. And the details of licensing have still to be agreed and there's a lot of discussion going on there. But a small victory, but an important one, the word pests was taken out of the bill. So this old fashioned value laden language no longer appears. And I do think that's symbolic. And the other new thing that the Scottish government added in was a new offence of trail hunting, which is defined as laying an animal based scent for dogs to follow. And when we come on to the English legislation, you will see why, I'm sure you know already, but uh, you'll see why the new offence of trail hunting was deemed necessary. So turning to England and Wales now, it was an equally diff difficult gestation to get a, a bill through at Westminster. It took a little bit longer. There were, again, there were attempts at private members' bills and these all fell. Um, this time it was a government bill and that always gives a bill a much better chance of success. And Prior to introducing the bill, the government had commissioned Lord Burns, a retired senior civil servant, to carry out a very detailed inquiry. And this resulted in an extensive review. I think it is fair to say that both sides of the argument found things to cherry pick out of the Burns report. And the thing that I want to cherry pick tonight is this quote, which is that Burns reported that hunting with dogs seriously compromises the welfare of the quarry species. And therefore, going back to our ethical basis for legislation, we have a strong case to legislate to protect wild mammals from this kind of suffering. So the bill went through um, slightly different approach from the Scottish Act. It creates a blanket offence of hunting a wild mammal with a dog unless the hunting is exempt. And again, we have various causing and permitting offences, as you would expect. It creates a separate offence of hair coursing, either participating in hair coursing or entering your dog in a hair coursing event. So that's got a straight prohibition on it. And then to what is exempt hunting? Well, this is all set out in a schedule to the Act. It sets out a number of conditions, quite a long schedule, but it says you may use no more than two dogs for stalking and flushing out to protect livestock, crops, fisheries. You're beginning to come, become familiar with these permitted purposes or obtaining meat for human or animal consumption. In other words, if you're hunting for the pot or shooting. Um, again, a wild mammal must be shot dead as soon after it's found as possible. And this is just to prevent prolonged suffering. And regrettably, the use of one dog is permitted below ground. And this is known as the gamekeeper's exemption to protect game birds. So um, this is to control pests, as you would say, um, which are threatening game birds. I, sh I should have said with regard to the Scottish legislation, below ground use is still permitted. It was permitted under the 2002 Act and it is still permitted, again, in, in the face of opposition from the animal welfare groups. So what happened after the 2004 Act was passed at Westminster, covering England and Wales, immediately the hunts and the opponents of the law said, this is bad law, it's unworkable, it's unenforceable and uh, nobody is going to be prosecuted under this legislation. And you will find that people with hunts, uh, involved with hunts, are usually very well resourced 
and there's been resort to judicial review, human rights challenges, none of which have been successful. Um, it's not a human right to, to uh, hunt a wild mammal with a dog. It's not part of your private and family life. It's not part of, it's not a devolution issue either. And this was decided in, um, in the courts in Scotland after the Scottish bill. And so uh, I was trying to find out how many prosecutions there have been, and this is from the Hunting Act website. So uh, that's a, a site that it exists to advise prosecutors and enforcers. I don't really know very much about it, but they say there have been over 573 successful prosecutions. So that is a pretty good record. What I'm not sure about is how many of these relate to fox hunting, because as I said, in Scotland, it's mainly hair coursing that the legislation has been used for. Um, I just mentioned that there's a lot of really interesting um, case history if you want to read up on it. And this one, DPP against right, is a very interesting one about the burden of proof question and about defining hunting. And if you wanted to ask for more references, I could easily find those for you. But the other thing that happened after this legislation was the development of trail hunting, which I've mentioned already. Trail hunting didn't exist before 2004. It was created entirely to ensure the continued existence of working packs of hounds, because many people in the hunting world believed that this act would be overturned and they would get back to hunting in the old way and they wanted to keep the dogs working in the traditional manner. So they did this by laying a scent trail usually made from fox urine or mimicking fox urine in an area generally where foxes or hares are likely to be present. The hounds would pick up the scent and follow it but of course they could equally easily be distracted by the scent of a real fox and go off after it and this is what we're seeing I'm sure you'll see on social media every night I see reports from hunt monitors and hunt sabs saying they've seen another uh, trail hunt allegedly illegally hunting using this exception and um, sometimes the most recent one I saw involved terrier work as well where dogs had been dogs had been used to dig out foxes and I think it was two foxes were then thrown to the hounds to be hunted again. As far as I can see, that is completely illegal and it has been repudiated by the hunting authorities. But as long as this goes on, it undermines the, uh, the strength of the 2004 Act. And the Scottish government was very much made aware of that when they were bringing their new legislation through. And following strong evidence that hunting high, uh, figures were advising people to use trail hunting as a smokescreen and uh, uh, actually a criminal conviction in one case for doing this. A number of landowners, National Trust, Lake District, National Park, um, Ministry of Defence have now banned trail hunting from their land. So that's one way that uh, the picture is changing. But I do, I do think that trail hunting is something that's going to require reform at some stage in England and Wales. Moving on to Northern Ireland. Um, fox hunting and stag hunting are still legal in Northern Ireland. There is widespread opposition. Hare coursing was actually banned in 2011. So that wasn't necessary to be addressed. But there, again, there's been attempts to legislate on this, and the most recent one was the Hunting Wild Mammals Bill that John Blair of the Alliance Party introduced in November 2021. Now, he did all the due diligence. He carried out a major consultation and received 18,000 responses. Nonetheless, the Countryside Alliance attacked the bill and said that it was unworkable clumsily cobbled together illogical, dangerous proposal, proposals and an attack on the rural way of life. So these arguments are very persuasive and they certainly were listened to by the, the representatives. The basis of the bill by John Blair was three separate offences 
the organizing or participating in the hunting of a wild mammal with a dog, trail hunting and terrier work. And then again, you see this pattern of exemptions being created to allow other country sports to continue. Exempt hunting is defined in section four. You can use dogs in any way to control rats and mice. Again, we have stalking or flushing to guns with the purposes of preventing or reducing damage to livestock crops or property, obtaining meat. Um, but this must be no more than two dogs. So I think you'll see there are common approaches, there are variations, but generally in principle, the, the same kind of approaches are being taken across the different administrations in order to uh, control and reduce the use of dogs. Uh, what happened next? Um, the bill was introduced at the end of 2021. There was a second stage debate in the assembly and unfortunately this bill was lost 38 votes to 45. And again, the reason for this was this old chestnut about the innocent dog walker. This, th there was a lot of very good contributions. I would recommend reading the debate if you're interested in it. But um, people were saying, you know, anyone walking their dog and they go running off after a wild mammal is going to be criminalized by this legislation. And I do think it's a myth but it's a very pervasive one and um, it really does need to be nailed if legislation is to be successful. And I think Lord Bonamy's report made a very good contribution to that debate and uh, people would be, well, the Scottish government certainly read that and took the message on board. So just to summarize, this is a rather convoluted story and thank you for bearing with me while I've been running through these pieces of legislation. But just to summarize, they all started from slightly different perspectives in different countries with different traditions. For example, stag hunting has been banned in Scotland since 1959, but it was still permitted in England and Wales prior to the 2004 Act, and it is still permitted in Northern Ireland. Um, but I'm seeing signs of increasing similarity as the different models draw on one another. Um, the two dog limit is something that's hard to achieve, but I think we can see it. We've, we, we've got it in England and Wales, we've got it in Scotland, and the Northern Ireland bill took that same approach. Um, it is much contested, but it, it, is, um, it is feasible. We're seeing specific prohibitions on trail hunting. I did think that the recent Northern Ireland bill, it had the benefit of simplicity, but actually it missed out certain details, for example, in definitions of work below ground. And I think there was a possibility that it could have incorporated some loopholes, but that is what the parliamentary process is about. That is what amendments are all about. They're to improve legislation. If the general principles are right, the representatives can do their job. And, and make it workable. So I do hope that in Northern Ireland there'll be another attempt at legislation on uh, mounted hunting. There's useful models here and hopefully all that experience that we've all been through over the last 20 years and more will be useful as things go forward there. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Libby. And obviously, quite questions you. if you like. That picture is really funny. God, <laughs> too cute. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. That was really, that was fantastic. Honestly, okay. I, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I didn't know any of that information before. Honestly, that was, oh, that good. was really <laughs> informative and really useful. Thank you very much, Barbara. One never knows how much the audience will know, but uh, I think the benefit of going back such a long way <laughs> is that I've got the narrative there. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Libby. It was really good. Very, very complex. Um, <laughs> there's so much to it, many different layers of um, legislation. So yeah, thank you. I can tell you put a lot of work into it. Thank you.